This program is a joint production of the Kimokeo Foundation, whose mission is to preserve and perpetuate Hawaii's unique culture, language, people, and environment. Information is online at kimokeo.org. And Maui Causes, a crowd-funded media production group supporting not-for-profit, progressive, and environmental causes in Maui County. Join us on the web at mauicauses.org. Hello, Kakeyako Maui. Welcome to the Kimokeo Foundation show. We're so fortunate and glad to have uh, all of you with us this morning. And we want to thank Akaku again for having us here in Maui. Um, Kimokeo Foundation is of uh, preservation, perpetuation, and education of its Hawaiian culture. And mainly, uh, we're focusing on the Hawaiian language. So Kimokeo Foundation uh, is working together with uh, Puna Naleo o Maui and their nonprofit called Naleo Pulama. And uh, I wanted to let everyone know that uh, Puna Naleo o Maui has its Ho'omao um, on March 24th at the Maui Nui Botanical Garden. Gates open at 9 a.m. You can um, go to ho'omao.com and get your tickets and uh, support Punanaleo Maui, having great entertainment and food, um, a lot of great crafts there. And for those of you who have been there for the many, many years, they've had it. And I think it's their 31st uh, annual Ho'omao. So please put on your calendar March 24th, Ho'omao at Maui Nui Botanical Garden. Doors open at 9 o'clock. Ho'omao.com. Mahalo. This morning I have some special guests with me and I'll let them introduce themselves. And we'll be talking about island living, island style, environment, and culture in different ways on another country. Having with me is... Uh, my name is Sue Milligan, and uh, I live on a little island called Copper Island, which is in Jervis Inlet, a 42-mile long fjord on the mainland of BC. It's about 60 miles northwest of Vancouver. Dee? I'm Dee Hamby, and I live uh, sustainability off of uh, off-grid, and I love not having to pay Miko and water companies. Um, learn to live island style and take care of our our culture and our sustainability. I belong to the um, the farmers union and uh, try and grow things for ourselves so we don't have to buy. But uh, I'm thank you, Uncle, for being here. Yeah. So you know, it's uh, it's really great to have both of you here with me this morning, and uh, both of you have uh, known me for a few years now, and uh, both of you um, have shared uh, island style, island living. So. I'm really um, grateful to have you guys here and to um, understand, have the people understand that, um, you know, living in Maui is a special place and that uh, it is island style and sustainable living. And as much as we have commercialization, there's many, many things that are happening on Maui that's sustainable living. But, you know, first I wanted to uh, really ask you, Sue, because you live on a copper island Mm -hmm. And uh, Copper Island is like 17 acres. Yes. And uh, this is where you and your husband uh, reside. And so tell us, you know, Sue, how long you've been on the island and uh, what do you guys do? Because you're in a Vancouver Island area. You know, they, the public here on Maui don't know so much about because Vancouver has a lot of islands. Mm. And uh, in fact, and how we got to know each other is through the va'a, through the canoe. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so just like our canoe, Hemoku kava'a, he kava'a hemoku, you know, like an island in a canoe and a canoe <laughs> in an island. So here we have similar situation happening to you because uh, you have a canoe, you know, and uh, you share that with your island folks. So, you know, so kind of describe uh, kind of where you're located at and what is the closest island to you guys because for you to come out, you have to come out with your own boat and go back to your own boat. Mm -hmm. And you guys have an inland or inlet to go to and fro. But other than that, it's 120 miles away from that island to get to you guys, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, um, Bob and I uh, lived on Copper Island for about 40 years. Uh, I was uh, brought up on another island, Nelson Island. It's a bigger island next to us. My dad uh, moved up there in 1949. 
Uh, he was a logger and then uh, I went to the city for about four years then I met Bob traveling and I realized that my roots were um, back on in Jervis Inlet on the P Pacific Ocean on on that side so um, we bought this island it had never been um, lived on by other people other than the First Nations people and um, we put a van that we had camped in that we drove from Ontario because my husband's from Ontario we drove it out here we put it on a log float we towed it over to our island we had a couple of chainsaws and a, sh uh, a shredder. We um, cleared it enough so that we get our van on, and we uh, built a, a house that, uh, for about three thousand dollars. Our first house. Um, then we both worked in the booming grounds for a while. Then I bought a fish boat, and my husband bought a little tugboat. So I we fished, and um, I have a big garden. We grow. We I look after the ocean as well. I, we have clams. We have oysters. I fish. Uh, we don't have any power there. We have our own power. We have solar power like uh, D has. And uh, we have backup generators because we don't have as much sun as you guys do. Mm -hmm. But uh, we have a pretty good um, system. Well, that's great. So, you know, um, you are raising your own food there now. Mm -hmm. And so what's happening with uh, winter now there? So it's not as warm as it would be summertime, but you really don't have a lot of snow, do you? No, we're really lucky actually. We, things grow where we live a very small part of the south coast that's quite mild, uh -huh. but I still have things like parsley in my garden and, and greens and um, a lot of the vegetables will overwinter, like I can overwinter all the cabbage, cabbage family or beets and uh, carrots, potatoes. So I still have things in my garden and there's still yeah, wild things I can pick. Yeah, but you're totally away from uh, anybody. So all mm -hmm. of that, you know, especially the ground. How do you prepare your ground to, ah. to do all your food? Uh, because, you know, everybody's talking about organic food and how they're doing their ground and making sure no fertilizers are used, no insecticides are used, you know. Yeah. So I would assume that you're just doing all that with what you have because you, being on a little island like that, don't have all the services. So on that island, are you and Bob the only residents? We are. We bought it with another couple, and they have uh, been there for about uh, 20 years now. And they spend the winters. They don't spend the winters there, though. Mm -hmm. So they spend the, 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 the rest of the year there. And uh, we had to sift all our soil because it's quite rocky. And uh, I use seaweed from the ocean. And I used to use starfish for fertilizer and the bones of the fish that I catch. I use that for fertilizer. I still have to buy some granulated fertilizer, but I don't use any pesticides and I don't use any uh, commercial fertilizers. Mm. Oh, so it's interesting that uh, you use the seaweed, the bones yeah. from the fish, and the starfish. And the leaves from the trees. And the leaves from the trees. Yeah. And you compost them. Yeah. And so that's with your own waste. Yes. You know. Yeah. And so are you guys having a compost uh, restroom there or you guys? Uh, well, we did for the first 23 years. We just lived in a little house. We had an outhouse yeah. and we used to use lime on it. And then you dug it out and dug it under the trees. You wouldn't put that in your vegetable garden. And uh, now we built a, a what I call a real house uh, uh, in 1998. And so now we have a septic field. Oh, I see. We put, yeah. Oh, pretty great. And what about fishing? Tell, tell us about what, what do you guys fish for and when do you guys fish? Because, mm. you know, we, um, uh, we're we pretty lucky at the temperature we have here and what uh, we have and what we used to have. But uh, tell us about fishing in your island. Well, I used to be able to fish all year round for cod and um, mostly the cod and the bottom fish. We have a red snapper that's similar to your opaka paka. And um, so I'm mostly a, a, a bottom, I fish bottom fish, like ling cod, red snapper, rock cod. Mm. And now there's a season to them. I can only fish from May to September, but I have a, a dock and a wharf in front of our house. Then I get mussels or worms and catch little fish like perch and shiners. And I use them for bait. And then I go out to the deeper water to catch the so, big fish. So the mussels is growing on your pier? Yeah. And then... Uh, yeah. And you're saying, you, what, what kind of worm are you talking about? Sea worm? Uh, sea worms. Yeah, you pull the muscles off and there's usually sea worms or I dig. So is that the same as all sea worms here yeah, in the sea in, uh, in the ocean here at the fish? They might be. I don't know. There's different, there's a Torito worm that eats the boats that uh -huh. they're the same. But these ones are a worm that, they, they sort of look like a garden worm, except they're, they, they're a little tougher skinned and they live in the, in the, in the and water. And how do you prepare them? I just use them to, I use them for, I uh, put on a hook, then I catch the smaller bait, and then I use that bait to catch the bigger fish. So you need two baits to catch one fish. Yeah. 
A lot yeah. of work, right? Yeah. Yeah, it is a lot of work. Mm -hmm. So when, when you talk about um, your garden, so how many pounds do you think you harvest out of your garden? Or how many times you go to your garden and harvest? Um, I probably go out almost every day. So I've got, uh, I have raised beds because we don't have a lot of earth. And um, Bob, um, we had a sawmill too, so Bob made boards, but they always kept rotting and stuff. So they poured cement, uh, concrete um, forms that are four by about 12 or 14 feet. And then uh, we have to sift all the earth, put that in, in there. And pretty much I get something out of my garden all year round. I still have squash left. Mm. And then we finished the potatoes, but there, then there's some hardy greens that still so live. So population Every of day. four, are you guys uh, considered a community garden or are you guys both do your own gardening? We both do our own gardens now, yeah. Yeah. And you guys share food or you share things once in a while? Yeah, we always, yeah, the, the, like if I catch an extra fish so or we on, catch prawns or we, we yeah, we, we share things. So you're on 17 acres, you said. Mm -hmm. right? So where is the other house on the island? So you are north, east, west, south, so where, where well, is that? Our house faces um, a west and that's about maybe 700 or 800 feet, well, uh, where their house is and their house faces south and then the dock is sort of in between uh -huh. and the garden is in between us. So the dock is shared between both of you? Yes, we share the dock and the road. So there, is there any other room for other people to just come and visit or what? Oh, our place is very busy. And the interesting thing is um, Bob and I don't have any children, but all my uh, nieces and great nieces and extended family and friends, they all are, we're busy all year round. Everybody comes and a lot of the kids now want to know how to can and they want to know how to garden. They're, oh, cool. they're, that, they're, that's, so that's part of what I like to do is show them how to fish, show them uh, how to garden, how to grow things, how to preserve things, canning, yeah. uh, storing. Well, so. it's really exciting because, uh, you know, people that we have on different areas uh, in Hawaii almost do exactly what you do. Mm -hmm. You know, and Molokai is really uh, on their own on a lot of times. So it's called, uh, you know, Molokai is called Momona Island, which is fat, fat with the fish, fat with what they have on mm -hmm. the land. So it's really great that uh, they do that and they're kind of special people, you know, so you hear a lot about, um, you know, not wanting this, not wanting that. So they're, they're really protecting their lifestyle and we got to appreciate and honor that because uh, they're using their reef for the refrigerator, they're using their mm -hmm. land, you know, mm -hmm. on gardening and hunting. So we like to, as Maui people and everybody in the state of Hawaii and uh, the world to respect that, respect the island of Molokai for whom they are, what they are, what they're doing, you know? And exactly the same thing you're doing. And so Dee, you know, mm -hmm. um, we you've known Uncle for over 20 years now, and uh, oh. your first uh, visit with Uncle was uh, in uh, Honokohau Valley, but uh, I think that you, you're involved with uh, a lot of stuff that would be interested to let Maui people know of, uh, of what you do right. with self-sustainability and who you're working with. Um, well, I work with the Farmers Union, and um, all of our farmers are to go-to go people. Like if we need to know something, or we need compost, or we're not understanding what can grow, or you know where we live. You know, we live off-grid and uh, want to grow things that we can feed ourselves with. Um, I'm also involved, I'm on the board of the Boo Boo Zoo, um, which is animal protection, and I'm also on the mayor's board for um, uh, the uh, Commission for Status of Women. Mm -hmm. So I work a lot with the council and I'm pretty much in government involved and you know, you know a lot of what I do because we're yeah. in touch a lot. But um, I, think the, I think my passion is sustainability. You know, I work coal lobby. I take people over from California that don't understand the Hawaiian culture that you taught me mm -hmm. um, a lot about um, that's why we fell in love with you and the island, is um, coming over here and understanding the culture and appreciating, um, you know, what we've learned since we've been here. But, um, and working on Ko'olawe and understanding, you know, how precious our island is and how to appreciate it and how to take people over and get involved. And um, I do a lot of volunteer work, as you know, <laughs> Um, but I love people coming over here and getting involved with the culture, yeah. not just being a not just being a visitor, but being involved with and understanding our culture and our language, and um, and the people 
you know, that make it so special for us to live here. Um, so. Yeah, I think that's uh, the part I like about you, Dee. You, um, you appreciate the Hawaiian culture and you appreciate the Hawaiian people and you appreciate uh, working with them and sharing with that and how others should respect and how others should care for it because it's really difficult, as you know, um, in uh, the Hawaiian culture, there's a lot of struggling going on for all kind of things, you know, in all sections of uh, what we call the living lifestyle of the Hawaiian person or families, you know. Huh. And uh, one of the, uh, the key thing is that I, I had both of you guys come on the show because sustainability is really important, you know. And as you, as you live it and as, as her, many of the families live it. You know, a lot of people are growing their own food, you know. Kalo, a lot of people mm. growing banana, a lot of growing sweet potato. Um, you know, a good example is uh, Uncle Bobby Paia. Uncle Bobby, so, yeah. You know, Uncle Bobby is, uh, you know, so, you know, as a, uh, and you're working close with him on some of the stuff. So explain to, to Maui, you know, uh, Uncle Bobby will be here one day, but I think this explanation is how he has made an impact with a lot of people because he's doing a lot besides what he's doing. and taking that knowledge and practice to share in different places so and you being with him so share a little bit about that okay well um, I'm part of the um, farmers uh, mentor program farmers apprentice program and uh, it was a long seven months and Uncle Bobby was one of our mentors and took us to his farm and he, Uncle Bobby is so passionate about what he does you know, I need to give him some chickens now, but uh, he wants to grow pigs and he wants to teach us how to be sustainable, you know? And it, if you just saw his farm and how much he go, it goes into him, uh, his passion for what he does, and his, it, it resonates with all of us because he's, he's one of our mentors. And when you say mentor, it's like you teaching Bob and I about the island you know, about the culture and being here and being part of the island, not just a visitor, not just a resident, but you told me one time, a long time ago, Uncle, you can bring what you know, you know, I have a, I have a couple degrees and bring what you can to the island and teach other people like you do. And that's how I feel about Uncle Bobby Paia. You know, Uncle Bobby is, um, um, when you call passion, you know, I reflect that on, not passion, but I reflect it that his lifestyle. You it's know, being who he is, what he does, and uh, how he does it, and how he um, shares um, his uh, product, how does he share his knowledge, it's just how he is, you know? Uncle Bobby lived that lifestyle every day. Yeah, he, do know? he does, Uncle, and it's like John Donovan. John will give every minute of his day uh, to teach you how to grow watercress. You know, and when you get to see these farms and when you get to see the sustainability and when you get exposed to... Well, explain to us the Farmers Union now because they're doing all sorts of um, growing. Yeah. And I think people need to understand that uh, our Farmers Union is really a small community. It's not like a huge community. But our Farmers Union is making a big impact on sustainability each place because we have a Farmers Union here up in the country and now we have a Farmers Union here down uh, Waehu with uh, Lika Atai and, uh, and then we have oh, Lika, James yeah. Simpliciano on the west. So take, take the sections and explain to us what each of doing because I know where every day they're meeting and they bring their own food there and, and meet and discuss the, um, the challenges they have with the farm with either the, the community or either with county or either with the state or the federal and how they do it because that's really how we all uh, was brought up in a, in a living farm family, you know, and how we gathered our food, you know. Uh, well, um, first of all, I know all, most of the chapters. Uh, we have Haleakala, which meets in Haiku. Um, then now they have the Lahaina um, uh, chapter, and they, uh, they, the one that meets a tropical plantation, I don't, that's the west side. Um, and we all meet and we all want to go to each other's meeting because we learn so much from each other um, of how we farm and how we can give back to the community and raise, we want to raise farmers. You know, each part of the island has a, has a different element, you know, a different uh, nature element. So whether you have so much rain, uh, so much wind, or great soil, or not so great soil. So let's take one of them at a time because I know we have three we have Haleakala, don't we have Waihu? 
Yeah, we have Waihui. And then we have West Side, right? Right. So let's take Haleakala because I think they're the oldest or um, ancestral farmers union we had and yeah. how they started and how they made it, in fact, to start off the West Side and Waihu. Yeah, well, Haleakala is we're so passionate about what we do with the Farmers Union. I mean, everybody shares everything at every meeting. We, you know, we give and we take and share each other's, like how can we make it a little bit better to farm um, and share our, instead of going to Costco. So how many farmers are you talking about that's in there? 300. At Haleakala. We have the largest farmers union in And so, in, you know, what Hawaii. kind of product are we talking about? Uh, we're talking uh, Kahlo. Uh, we're talking eggplant. We're talking uh, cucumbers, which is my passion. I love cucumbers. Um, any sustainable crop that we can do uh, up this way because it's wet up here as opposed to Lahaina where Bobby is. Bobby grows totally different stuff, different things because he's so warm and we're so wet. So we all share what we can make it, make half, what can make. Wh what about animal products? What kind of animal product? What kind of animals are we raising up there? Pigs. Pigs. For sure. What about chicken? Uh, chickens. We're raising chickens right Any now. Any rabbits? Any goats? Uh, no goats and rabbits. Uh, not not in a sustainable uh, amount. Uh -huh. And yeah. so the cattle is just done with our local ranchers? No, cattle is local, definitely. With the ranchers, yeah? The big ranchers. And so you guys are not involved with that, but we have three ranch, a large ranch, right? Yeah. We have Haleakala, yeah. uh, we have Ulupalakua, and we have Ko'onu'ula Ranch. Yeah, well, we have yeah. the one where our food truck is. is uh, I don't know who puts their cows there, but... Well, that's with uh, Maui Cattlemen's Association. Oh, okay. So it's great that you brought it up. So, you know, that land used to be HCNS land. Right. And so HCNS is taking... Uh, um, everybody's asking what HCNS is doing, you know? Uh -huh. So HCNS is really um, trying to bring, you know, farming back to its own land. And so, you know, a lot of question is about what are they going to do with this land? What are they going to, and you know, I don't know personally myself because I haven't talked to HCNS, but I do know that yeah. one of the first actions they've done is bring the cattle, Maui Cattlemen's Association. And so that's what you see out uh -huh. in um, Apa Hokipa. Ho Hokipa. And uh, I think there's other things happening with them, with um, sheep, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so they're, they're definitely doing something. Um, it's not like, uh, a public thing for everyone. It's just they're doing, I know they're doing a lot uh, as far as trying to make sure that farming comes back, you know? And I, and you were on, you were with the mayor's uh, office, right? Yeah, I'm with and the so, mayor's so office. So the mayor has something going on with HCNS on. So, you know, can you bring us up to date about that or what do you know about that? Um, I'm not sure what the mayor's, uh, uh, again, there's an election coming up, so we're not sure where we're going with that, but, um, I'm on the council for the status of women, and I work with a lot of uh, prisoners, women that are in prison, that have children. So I love to see some proactivity um, with when they come out or what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where I work with the mayor. I don't work as much. Yeah, so I think the e e election uh, you're talking about is 2018, that we have um, a, a lot of happening with that and candidates running for mayor, candidates running for council. But I, I reflect on that because, you know, I'll go back to Sue, you know, it doesn't really matter who gets elected. I mean, I, it makes a difference for our county because we, we uh, depend on that representing of what we're going to do with our land and our people. But over there, you know, there's got to be only four people, so they can't mm -hmm. be worried about the outside world. Mm -hmm. they got to be worried about Copper Island world, because you wake up next day, you got to live, right? Mm -hmm. I, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt, Uncle, but mm -hmm. um, who governs your island? Oh, <laughs> that's an interesting question. Um, it isn't really. They used to call me, I, I was the queen of Copper Island. I even had a crown, but it was just a <laughs> silly you know, thing. But we just had to work out what we, what we were going to, what we were going to do. But we're in an unusual situation politically because where our access is, is a different um, regional district than what we pay taxes to. So because mm -hmm. where we pay taxes to, it's too far away to, for us to get to. Yeah. So. Um, we're sort of a very fortunate when people just leave us alone because we're sort of out uh, we're too hard to get to and no so we're not really 
interfered yeah, but, with. But you, you, you are aware that there's politics. Yes. Right? Yeah, well, yes. I was just And so I just, uh, I'm mm -hmm. really glad uh, that was brought up because of election year. So I just want to share with Maui and everybody, you know, uh, politics is all our concern. And so for, for everybody on Maui, you know, um, uh, Maui Nui is a, a group of people that was trying to make sure that we all register and vote. So at this time, we like Thank to you, make Uncle. sure that everybody, you, you, you're going to make a difference. Yeah, You're going to make a difference of who we elect or what we do with our land, what we do, everything, you know, what we do, senior housing or affordable housing. So if you have not registered, please register. Because Thank you, you Uncle. will definitely make mm -hmm. a difference, you know. And, uh, you know, I, I know that it's, uh, it's really um, something that is important for you, yourself, can make a difference, yeah, for Maui, the county of Maui, uh, Lanai and Molokai. So please, uh, you know, go and register and make sure that uh, you um, elect the people that will make a difference for what you think and what you believe in on Maui, you know. So I just wanted to kind of plug that in because uh, uh, you're, you're on a little island, 17 acres here on Maui, Lanai, Molokai, Molokini, Kaholawe. They're all part of our county, and they all have some kind of jurisdiction. So the key word is jurisdiction, you know? Yeah. And uh, so that's really important for that, you know? Kind of there. But going back to um, uh, sustainability, you know, um, I want to remind you guys that there's a Hanukkah I think it's the correct word, or that's out Hana, where a group of community doing what you guys talk about. They have a community garden out there and they work together and uh, it's Ricky Rutis group. Ricky is part of that group and he started uh, with the Hana High School, working with them, teaching them how to be carpenters, how to be sustainable, build their own house. And when they graduated, they got their own tools and go out and they actually went out and painted Kupuna houses, helped Kupuna clean the yard and do electrical work, plumbing work and they actually built a van with a solar system on top that they can take the van and work right off the van with its own electric generator to work on places that was out there that didn't have any electric. And also took the project to Molokai and help on Molokai. So, um, so there's, a, there's some secret things happening on Maui, you know? And really a lot of things happening um, when you talk about Kalo, you know, different, different farmers um, that raise in taro, you know? Um, all over, you know, you get Hoko Ao Pellegrino, you get Uncle Bobby, uh, you get the Wailua residents, the KNI residents, the Hana residents, um, Kahakuloa and Honokahau. So a lot of other different acres, including Honolua, you know, mm -hmm. you know. So I think that uh, hopefully one day they will we'll get the, the Kalo people in here, you know. So I think that there's a lot of sustainability that has been done on Maui and like that, all the farmers, they need help and they need water, mm -hmm. you know. And so I'm not really uh, detailed about that, but we uh, really appreciate uh, the Dewey Ohana, you know, um, getting the Navai Eha and his group and all the people that worked with that whole Hokao Pellegrino in uh, Navai Eha, you know, movement, uh, you know, and really appreciate uh, it went and uh, Mahilani on the east side, and I know that uh, the key is the water for all of us, and I know the key to water of us, how HCNS, how East Maui Irrigation is all, need to work together, we'll work together because we're all on the same island, so I wish all of the parties, uh, you know, settle and make sure that we uh, keep Maui uh, sustainable and keep Maui working together to move forward in the future about future farming and uh, future fishing because the water is really important uh, as well as you guys know from the mountain to the sea and how it works out in our culture about Maka Makai, you know. Mm -hmm. um, just this morning I was on the canoe and explaining to the people about the local ia out at, uh, you know, um, Kona Ulu in the South Maui and how uh, the water uh, is important to come from the top of the mountain to the stream because of the the different lifestyle of the, the ecosystem, you know? And so I don't know about that with where you come from because uh, uh, you have you guys have a lot of salmon, so 
They got. They have a lot of water too. Yeah. Yes. So explain us. You you get salmon or um, uh, you get farming salmon or you just getting salmon on the wild now. I can catch. Well, we can catch wild salmon where 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 we are. I don't. I personally don't fish a lot of salmon because there's not a lot right where I am. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so they do have um, fish farms that we. Going back to politics, you, just our everyday life on the island, we're sort of in a division. But the, we have provincial uh, politics and federal politics that, that regulated regulate for the for fishing. The federal um, mm -hmm. regulates our wild fishing, and the provincial was regulating. So our in a in a federal um, uh, uh, politics, the uh, but my understanding is uh, each First Nation in that area has some rights to the salmon. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. So and can they you explain us their rights? Because uh, you know um, we struggle with our own rights as culture people mm -hmm. on fishing and sustainability over here. So explain us about what you understand in this 2018 about the federal rights that. Uh, with the First Nations? The First Nations. They have uh, a, what we call a food fishery. So they have the rights to um, fish uh, what they need for their, um, for, for, for their sustainability, for their, for their uh, uh, not only just food, but for their culture and for their... Um, so is that every day or that's, uh, uh, that's, no, that's governed it, by season? Yeah, it's by season. Like the sockeye is their, sockeye is their big, the natives, that's their big fish. That's the one that they, they sockeye like salmon. the sockeye salmon, because we have five species of salmon. So the sockeye salmon are there. What, what are the five piece species? Um, there's what we call spring salmon. I think the Americans call them kings. And we have cohos, which I think you guys call silvers. We have uh, sockeye. We have uh, pink salmon or humpbacks. And we have the dog salmon. And the dog salmon is another one that the natives use a, a lot. And they're the most plentiful ones. And they, they're the ones that well, go I'm up glad, the river. I'm glad that the, 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 they, the First Nation, have their rights. Uh, and, yeah, uh, it's know been a struggle. And know their rights pertain forever. So that's a really a great thing. Mm -hmm. But we're going to take a break right now and continue talking about environment and culture. This program is a joint production of the Kimo Keo Foundation, whose mission is to preserve and perpetuate Hawaii's unique culture language, people, and environment. Information is online at kimokeo.org. And Maui Causes, a crowd-funded media production group supporting not-for-profit, progressive, and environmental causes in Maui County. Join us on the web at mauicauses.org. Thank you guys so much for the first session of the Kimo Keo Foundation show. And uh, we left off on the five different salmons, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, you're, you're saying that to me that uh, they have a, they, they also have a regulation. So can you kind of explain their kind of regulation of they, you know, when I ask you the question, can they fish every day and can they take as much as they want every day or what, what, what's the story? Well, it's a bit of, it's been a bit of a struggle because uh, um, sustainability has, has been brought into the question, you know, when, they're, when the stocks are low, when, they're, when they're, if there was too much rain and flooding, it destroys the, 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 the riverbeds where the salmon would go up to spawn. Um, or if there's a drought, if it's really dry, believe it or not, we do have droughts and there, there wasn't enough water for the fish to get up, up the river or there's um, whatever else happens. But usually there's enough fish for, and the herring is the, another thing that they, that the, and the ooligans, that they, that's what they used to use for uh, oil and trade. That was really important to them. But they're, like everywhere else, it's not as much as there was, but, um, and there has been issues about whether or not the, some of the native, the First Nations should be able to fish when it's, it might um, not be, be in danger to the, to the, to the population. Yes, yeah. yeah. So I think uh, that's almost like natural in nature, but remember that the First Nation was their first, that's what mm -hmm. they call the First Nation. Mm -hmm. And there was no other nation, so it would have been okay with them alone because there was supply for them all the time and there was an impact. But now we have mm. uh, people intruding on the First Nation, and so more people, more food, more fishing, and uh, the population is not able to support the increase in population. The population yeah. of either either growing food or fish farming is always hard because now we have to call it fish farming mm -hmm. so that to produce the fish 
for the, the greater population, where we never used to do that. We just farmed accordingly to the schedule that was taught mm -hmm. by our kupunas and our elders, you know? So same in Hawaii, you know, we, uh, we uh, used to pick opihi, uh, we pick we go spear nenui, uh, we, all sorts of fishes was part of our lifestyle and our culture, but because of the greater impact and not necessarily, um, you know, other population enjoy the fish too, so they go harvest it. Mm -hmm. So we, we at one time was the only one harvesting mm -hmm. it. Now everybody's harvesting it, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, where we uh, never used to have uh, commercial on the ocean, we now have commercialization. So um, mm -hmm. part of the environment is being impacted by, uh, it's almost like uh, where you live. You get four people right now. And so if we took even 60 people with a boat over there, it would be an impact. Once we set a footprint on your land mm -hmm. or your harbor, that footprint comes with different attitude, different attributes, mm -hmm. uh, and most of the footprint is come to take. They're not coming to give, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's uh, taking uh, the fish or taking the food. So um, every culture, but especially us guys here, you know, in Hawaii, so it's a really big impact, you know. And uh, we have to, um, today, 2018, abide by the laws that was put out for us in Department of Land and Natural Resources to, to do the same thing, because if we overtake, then we're not gonna have the population, you know. So we've been mm -hmm. given sizes and seasons, and, and, uh, and if we didn't have that, it, it'd be really hard with today's population, so. Mm -hmm. the, the, the DLNR is working with the community trying to maintain, you know, that policy. So whenever we fish, we're always going to have some fish. So we have some restriction on different type of fish, uh, shoreline, different sizes, you know, mm -hmm. uh, lobster season, you know. Uh, if we keep on taking, we're not going to have it. So um, where do we uh, appreciate Hawaiian culture and its ancient practice, Hawaiian culture with today's regulation is a heavy weight on our culture and heavy weight on our people. Meaning some agree and some disagree, you know? And I can understand both sides, but in the end, we all live on Maui and we have to make sure that things are regulated so we cannot overfish and overdo things, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that would be the same Oh, it's you know, very much the same, yeah. You know, so mm -hmm. whatever, um, I think it was, it's almost like climate change is happening everywhere, you know, and that's, a, and, that's a, and that's a discussion called environment. So what is happening with uh, climate change? And you said you've been on Copper Island for 40 years. So, yes. mm -hmm. so 40 years ago when you went there and 40 years now, mm -hmm. so what's happening with what you call climate change. Good, mm -hmm. good question. Well, it's been 60 years that I've lived in that uh, area, that, area. that whole area. So it is, but uh, the, I mean, it, it, the climate's always gonna change. Right now it's fast, I, I realize that. But in my lifetime, it, we used to have quite severe, what we call outflow winds, that would, when the interior was really cold and they blow down the inlets, and it would get like 20 degrees below zero. Things were, were the sea, the uh, ice, the, the salt water would freeze as it's splashing on to the things. We haven't had a one like that for, 1995 was the last one. And just to, that's just a minor part of it. Our rainfall, I keep track of that, and it's been getting less, actually. We have the odd year that, it's, that we have more. We get about 60 inches of, of rain a year where we are because we're in the mouth of an inlet and there's by two mountains that's similar to Haleakala and the West Maui Mountains that, that collect the rain. And last year we had like 36 inches of rain or the year before, so think, but th things change, really, it goes uh, up and down. It's really uh, interesting that you uh, say that, uh, what do you call it, wind? The out outflow wind. Outflow yeah. wind, yeah. that it comes down, it's uh, really very icy, cold. very yeah. cold. Mm -hmm. And then you said, uh, your, your rain, you know, you said that, uh, and that wasn't so significant, the wind, but the water was significant. Mm -hmm. Why was it significant? The, um, well, I don't, I'm not quite sure if I know what you mean, the significance well, of just the, that was just what well, hasn't changed. Well, all Okani means water of life for us. Mm -hmm. But a God Kani giving us water every day. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the water of life. You know, so I, I, I guess I pointed out that because I wanted you to explain how significant the water is to you up there 
and how significant the water is to us here mm -hmm. in the Hawaiian Islands and how, you know, um, the Nava'eha we have here, the four waters that flow from Mauna Kahalawai, you know, wa, uh, wa e, Waikapu, Wailuku, mm -hmm. uh, Waehu, Wahe, you know, that come down. And then we have East Maui, you know, trying to get more waters in the stream and more water. So, you know, water of life is really important to the Hawaiian people. And uh, mm -hmm. so, you know, one of the chants talks about Waiolo Kane, water of God, you know, where are you? And you promised me the water, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And this was uh, derived uh, from Kumukele Tawa and he himself uh, recently, someone was doing the chant and he, he forgot that he did the chant for, you know, um, Ku, the, well, the God with power, and uh, Lono, the God for food, Kanaloa, the God of the sea, and Kani, the Waiolo Kani, mm -hmm. you know, and so that's really important to us that we continue to have the rain, you know. Mm -hmm. We've been really fortunate in the last couple of days <laughs> we've had rain. Mm -hmm. In the last season we're, we, we had a lot of rain, you know, but uh, we go through that too, you know. And so the reason for you sharing your climate change and uh, how uh, it's not only us going through a climate change, no. it's, it's the world going through climate change, you know, and uh, how important it is to our environment and our culture. You know, if we, we don't have the water, we lose our environment and we lose part of our culture. You know what I mean? So it's really uh, interesting you say, you know, the wind, and then you talk about, oh, but the water, you know? Mm -hmm. And how you say that was 60 inches of rain, inches of rain mm -hmm. per year, mm -hmm. and now you get 30 inches of rain per year. Mm -hmm. So I would say 50% in 60 years, your climate drastically changed. changes. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and Dee can share with us. Now, so Dee, talk about, so uh, tell us about the environment. Okay, well, in, we live in Haiku off grid, and um, if we don't get water, um, then we don't have water, but if we get water, we don't have sun. So yeah. you're balancing mm -hmm. both of those. You right. know, you want water and you want sun. Um, but the last, I would say, since Bob and I have been up there, for the last five years, um, it has changed drastically in the last year and a half. Um, we're not getting the water we had, um, and we're, you know, and it's, it kind of amazes, and I know it's climate change, and we're getting cold, cold 50 degree nights. We never had 50 degree nights, ever, in Haiku. I mean, maybe 65 would be the coldest we'd ever get, but I, I see the environment changing. How long have you lived in that, uh, what the, um, Honopo? Yeah, off of Puniava. Puniava, off of Puniava, called Honopo. Yeah, off of Honopo. Off of Honopo. Yeah, and we've been there five years. Five years, so in the five years I knew you, uh, your residency, um, I remember going down to your um, little valley there and mm -hmm. having water just flow and it, having, it, it and, doesn't do it anymore. And then, and then the other day we went down there, which was just recently, about two weeks ago. Uh huh. And you have no water. No, I know, and you know it. it and it's changed drastically just yeah, in so the five years. So I think years. the measurement of climate change. I think, um, I think we all face it. We all realize it. But I think the concern is how do we um, help it? You know. You, know, it, mm -hmm. you have to mitigate it. You know, um, we can't grow the same things we used to grow up there. You know, we water more than we used to water, and we're more conservative, and we just don't know when we used to know. Um, uh, but I also, before we, before we, uh, um, uh, you know, living in the valley and living, you know where we love to live, um, I wanted you to talk a little bit about Keiki and uh, what Brian does for the community. Who? Brian McCafferty. Well, Brian McCaffrey. Oh, everybody knows Brian McCaffrey. Yeah, so. He called, he called it. Um, Teens on Call. Teens on Call. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, Brian is uh, is the heart of Maui, you know. Heart yeah. of Maui is a guy who's a roots, you know, roots of Maui. Yeah, we Beats every day, beats every day, beats every day, beats he, every day. He does. And so, you know, Brian is, uh, Brian should go and uh, work for Ever Ready Batteries. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because he doesn't run out that of energy. Is, you know? He's that like, cha, 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 cha. That every is, time you talk to him, he was like going here, going there, going here, going there, you know? I know, he's you got know. so much going on. And the reason I brought him up is because he got us, uh, we're farming there now. Yeah. And, uh, so Bob, I think, I think, uh, I think we, um, we love Brian, we care for Brian, and uh, 
I think that's a great point to bring up Brian, Brian McCafferty and Teens on Call. So share a little bit of, I, I know him for a long time and I can talk for days, but I want him, uh, I want you to talk about him because you guys had a recent impact of, uh, of what he made to your guys' lives, you know? Okay, I can tell you about the impact. You started it when you introduced me to Chubby Vincennes at uh, the Maui Chamber of, Commerce. Chamber of Commerce. Maui Native Hawaiian Chamber of Commerce. Yep, and then you said, go talk to Chubby. And I talked to Chubby, and Chubby said, well, A, A and B has a property that's leased to Brian McCafferty. Correct. And I um, pulled in there one day, and Brian, uh, we own a food truck in Ho'okipa, and um, I said, we don't have any place to park our truck because we can't drive it to the mm -hmm. we couldn't drive it to our house. We live in a valley. And uh, Brian said, well, let's try it. And we've been there for five years, and Brian <laughs> is Bob's best friend. I mean, they're like dumpster divers. They're just <laughs> like, they're two, two peas in a pod. Now, I think I want to go back to Brian, though. What, what, what has he done with our environment? Because that's the key thing. Because tell him about all the things he do to keep Maui. Mom. Oh, he recycles, recycles, recycles. He enthuses his ch his kids. His kids are his kids. I mean, he and it, Brian doesn't have his own kids, but he have a, he has his teens, and they work for him and they love him. I call, you know, I just and teens he's on call. He's yeah, mm -hmm. and he's always enthusiastic. And there's never a time I've ever seen Brian. Well, once in a while, he gets upset when we leave the gate open, but other <laughs> <laughs> otherwise, Brian has been one of our best friends and he gave us two and a half acres to farm. Yeah, so he, he's at mm. Tino Call for a long, long time. Yeah, so 93, I think. Yeah, so 93 to now, and you figure out how many years of that? Uh, I'm not good with math, but I can run into people at Paia Bay, kids. Right. The how many years, Sue? 25, is it? Yeah, oh. so he's been doing that for 20 something yeah. years. But, but the idea of Brian is what is their signature uh, works thing that teens on call. Uh, recycling sustainability. So they go out and pick up garbage. They pick up trash and they dump all the. They pick up trash from everywhere. And they divide and, it. Yep. To plastics, to aluminum, yep. to cardboards, yep. to batteries. Yeah. If you to, see uh, ice if, box. If you see Brian's operation on a daily basis, uh, I can't believe the work he gets done from those kids. Yeah. <laughs> and those kids get stipend. They get a stipend. That. So but they love Brian. If you want to support somebody, you need to go and look for Brian McCaffrey, Teens on Call, and support him and call him for events that you need the kids because he does more than just uh, recycling. He makes a big difference on our children in the Paia area. He, he certainly does. Like I said, I, um, I run into some of the kids at the beach, the homeless kids, and they say, I'm one of Brian's kids. Yeah, mm -hmm. you call them Brian's kids. Yeah, he said, I'm one of Brian's kids. But the for the years now, he's received the uh, liquids out of the uh, airport. Yeah, you know, he gets you know, a, he of, recycles so. all the all the bottles that come. People still take bottles of water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I know that yeah. everybody recycles, but I don't think anybody been recycling like ba uh, Brian does no. 18 hours a day with teens of call because he'll get up early in the morning. No, and, he's I, he, and try I, to put this yeah. this group of kids, and he would have, always have a conflict of amount of kids and places to go because he have two little kids and too many things to do within 18 hours. Yeah. And But when at the, the end of the day, Brian McCafferty and Teens on Call get it done. Yeah, but Uncle, you cool. you do the same thing, so. Well, I think that, uh, I think I'd, I'd like to know that uh, that we're all doing our part, you yeah. know, to keep Maui, you know, no koi, so. But Brian has made a, a big difference. We both, uh, a real good buddies, you know. I know you are. And, uh, Paddling buddies. And we both have uh, a living lifestyle of doing exactly that. Waking up in the morning. And paddling. And uh, <laughs> just do what we, we want to do and uh, make sure that the beneficiary is yeah. Maui. And another thing is, is it's kind of fun because Brian, whenever, I, whenever I'm on the property, um, he always has food for his kids. He feeds his kids. And it's like, he says, I always feed my kids. He'll spend, oh, I'll be in behind him in amount of foods mm -hmm. and he'll spend $40. But I think that's really important to uh, Maui in his environment and culture because um, yeah. Brian now have children that have grown up, you know, and still call him, I'm Brian's mm -hmm. kids, and they're doing the work that Brian is doing. Yeah. And sometimes not directly with him, but they've found their own passion, their own lifestyle 
of doing uh, growing of food because he likes to grow things. He loves to grow mm. things. So you know he has his own patch in uh, I think uh, Maliko Gauch. You know so he's doing that up there too. Yeah. Yeah. So Mike, he Brian likes to doing that. So all the kids love doing that. You know. I know you you can call him Brian and say hey you know we need some bananas he'll get you bananas you know or we need some tea leaves he'll get that you know mm -hmm. I say oh where you got that from Brian so oh we got our own garden you know and surprisingly enough he does have a valley and one of them is Maliko and I don't know where else he's growing like I do you know mm -hmm. but he just grows everywhere. Yeah. This might be a really good time to talk to the, all the visitors that come to Maui because I think you've got something like thing. six million because you brought it up about the water bottles. Some people leave their brains at home. Um, bring your own water bottles, bring your own carry cups, make an effort to recycle just because the condominium, like the condominium we live in, they don't, or stay in, they, they've got rid of all the recycling. So we've got it in a, in a cupboard, it doesn't take much, there's lots of other places around, I forget what it's called over in Kahului, but all of us that come to this beautiful island should realize it is an island. and what It doesn't you, go anywhere. <laughs> yes, it's landfill and garbage and uh, mm. uh, we need to uh, respect it a little bit more. It's mm. a little bit of an effort to do your recycling, but it's not hard. Yeah, and well, we I, really I think, do need to do that. I think, uh, you know, um, there's a part of the Visitors Association that uh, is doing uh, environment to. and gardening and culture. And, uh, and so a lot of them come here, like you say, you know, left their brains home. Mm -hmm. and this, and, but a lot of them have come here and brought their brains with them and have taken full responsibility. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of the sporting activities we have now, especially uh, the zip line, you know, if you go zip lining, they allow you to come with them and plant the native trees back, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, not only zip line, but you got Awahi, you know, which is uh, Art Madaris. Is, is, so if you go to awahi.com, they always have volunteers going up and we forest mm -hmm. it in uh, Haleakala. It's really a huge project of 43,000 mm -hmm. acres. And then yeah, a lot of them, and you can go to Ecolo Lindsay out at um, Honokawai and help that mm. uh, reforestate, you know, that part of the valley, you know, uh, uh, with Ecolo. And uh, we have everybody uh, doing it. So I, I think it's really a good point about all the visitors and the residents recycle. You know, I think we mm -hmm. all uh, have to um, be responsible or to keep Maui clean, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, I know that ev a lot of people are doing it, but I think we need to have more people doing mm -hmm. it more each day. Yeah, I think you know. Honoho Magazine um, should put, like, on their front page, first thing you open in Hawaiian Airlines is don't bring plastic. Don't bring mm -hmm. plastic or styrofoam to the island. No, bring your own bags. We, uh, we bring our own shopping bags. And every time you go to the beach, uh, when you, uh, every time you go for a walk, you take a bag and pick the garbage up. Well, I think uh, there's a lady um, that we can thank this time for the plastic is uh, Dale Borna's wife. What's her name? Yeah. She um, did the plastic thing and uh, made it all the way into the rules and regulation to not to use plastics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so... Uh, we're, we're having more and more people not using plastics, mm -hmm. and more and more people not using foam. More and more people are using uh, combustible, you know, um, things that will just degrade, you know, mm -hmm. instead of hurt the environment, you know. And uh, so I think that even though we do a lot, I think that we still got to do more, you know. Um, just, I know we're running out of time, but um, what do you do on your island to get Well, we have to look after everything. You know, uh, because there is no, you, you can't put garbage out on the thing. So we compost everything that, uh, paper, uh, every, uh, mm -hmm. all, the, all the food. We do have um, uh, recycling in Powell River. So we take bags of it and Bob takes uh, the, the recycling up to Powell River. But most of the stuff we try and reduce it because that's the other part. Recycling is fine, but you've got to start reducing things too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that's really, it's the things that you can't see, like those scrubbing bubbles those little tiny um, uh, bits that don't break down that the fish start eating. So anything that says scrubbing bubbles, we, should, we need to stop buying those sort of yeah. things. You know, well, I think that, um, um, you know, the Kimokeo Foundation show brings out environment and culture, you know, and uh, I just wanna, you know, continue uh, with that and more so to, uh, to let everybody know about, uh, you know, what we have on preserving, perpetuating, educating Hawaiian culture, and the foundation is doing, uh, you know, language 
and uh, Punana Leo Maui is our first um, uh, thing that we're doing with them. And so, um, what what do you guys know about our language? Well, every time I have visitors come, one of the books I put in their room is Hawaiian language. I have two big, thick books, mm. and I ask them to read the books and understand uh, communicating with, you know, the Hawaiian language. Um, it's easy language because there's no T's in the language. Well, there's only 12 <laughs> letters, right? I know. Mm. But um, I use it Very when kind. I can. Um, I can't use it like you can, but uh, I always give my visitors a little, uh, you know, a little mm. bit of a, you know, I've two books and I said understand what pe when people are talking to you especially if you if you see they're Hawaiian you know um, the policemen that come up to Hokeepa all the time we talk a little bit Hawaiian but mm -hmm. I'll talk to I think I think one of the, the, the thing that you know, everyone can be responsible is to know about the language you know and if they don't want to learn it then they should go to um, what we call Punanalea or Maui or uh, naleopolama.com because they just made a recent film uh -huh. about language, you know, and we have a lot of things. So you can go to hawaiianlanguage.com. Mm. Um, so I think you should go out and every time always promote that, you know, if you want to learn about the language, there's many places to go. And I think with the language, they'll have more of a, a respect of our culture, you know, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. in the language, there's a lot for every language in the world, you know, not to go extinct. But let me just say that it was really a great pleasure to have both of you ladies uh, here. Mahalo uh, Akaku and uh, the staff and small mahalo. Thank you guys so much. Aloha. 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 Thank you. This program is a joint production of the Kimo Keo Foundation, whose mission is to preserve and perpetuate Hawaii's unique culture, language, people, and environment. Information is online at kimokeo.org. And Maui Causes, a crowdfunded media production group supporting not-for-profit, progressive, and environmental causes in Maui County. Join us on the web at mauicauses.org. <laughs>